Today, we are going to discuss best practices for getting control of your blood sugar with Dr. Beverly Yates. If you or someone you love have been struggling with type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetes and you feel hopeless, frustrated, or confused about how to regain control over your blood sugar, you do not want to miss my conversation with Dr. Beverly Yates. Welcome to C60 Health Connections, where we meet with leading experts in the health and wellness space. Dr. Yates is a diabetes expert and author who has over 28 years of experience working with those who struggle with blood sugar issues related to type 2 diabetes and prediabetes. She's worked with thousands of people, helping them lower their blood sugar issues to a healthy range and get control over their health. She's on a mission to help 3 million people heal from blood sugar issues. She's an internationally recognized speaker and expert in the field of diabetes and heart disease, as well as a published author. Her book, Heart Health for Black Women, A Natural Approach to Healing and Preventing Heart Disease, is a groundbreaking book. She's also been featured on ABC, CBS, PBS, NPR, Fox, Fox Health, and Sirius XM, as well as many other outlets. My name is Jessica McNaughton, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer at C60 Purple Power. I'm a business executive with years of experience in corporate America, and for more than 20 years, I've been exploring various modalities in health, wellness, and spirituality. Now, before we get started, these statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. Any products or topics discussed today are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, mitigate, or prevent any disease. Beverly, I'm so excited to see you. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, Jess. Thank you so much for this invitation. I'm delighted to talk to you, and I'm eager to connect with whoever could be helped because some of these um, issues that go on blood sugar are so incredibly common, and they are debilitating. They really are a root cause, a central issue of why people have you know, a cascade of chronic illnesses and just don't live the quality of life that they deserve to live, to feel good, you know, to live and live the way they want to with the energy, the natural energy they should have. Yeah, I so appreciate the work that you're doing, that you're doing, and um, it's so needed and it's so very valuable. So thank you. Um, so let's just start at the at the at the beginning. Um, can you help me understand just what's the clinical definition of diabetes and pre-diabetes? Sure. So clinically, you know, diabetes, I like to say, is always more than a number, but we start with the diagnosis. So when your blood is drawn um, in a lab setting, perhaps at the doctor's office, or maybe you do it at home with a glucometer. Um, you get your blood drawn or a finger stick, a little drop of blood, and there's analysis that's done to determine what's the level of blood sugar in that blood. So there's two parameters that are looked at. One is your fasting blood sugar or morning blood sugars. This is before you've eaten anything for the day. So let's say you went to bed at 10 p.m. You get up at 6.30 a.m. Maybe you go to a lab at 7 a.m. They take your blood, right? You've had nothing to eat. You've probably had something to drink. That's fine. Water specifically is okay. I always ask people, don't drink anything else. Just just water. That won't affect your blood sugar. And they'll test your blood. From there, we get a number. If the number for your fasting blood sugar is under 100, for most clinicians, they will say you do not have type 2 diabetes, prediabetes, right? Um, if the number is over a hundred, then if it's, you know, a hundred, 101, 120, somewhere in there, people might say, Hmm, then we look at another measure called a one C. So a one C is short for hemoglobin, a one C or glycosylated hemoglobin. That's a mouthful, glycosylated hemoglobin, right? That's what really a one C stands for, but it's shortened to a one C just to make it simpler for the general public. But that number is a measure of your average blood sugar control, your blood sugar balance over the course of time, say three or four month period. That number is measured into ranges. So if your A1C is under 5.7, like if it comes up at 4.8, 5.2, that's considered healthy, normal, you're all good. There is no uh, prediabetes or type two diabetes situation there. Once your A1C gets to a range of 5.7 to 6.4, the diagnosis then comes in as pre-diabetes. If your A1C is 6.5 or higher, comes in at like 6.9, 7.3, 8, 10, gosh, 10, that's super high. That is absolutely type two diabetes. And with that diagnosis then, we'll determine um, typically the kinds of treatments that are offered. And in my opinion, those treatments should always be rooted in lifestyle things like nutrition, meal planning, 
consistent regular exercise that helps to build muscle because muscle will help with blood sugar control, stress, and sleep. Sleep does so much good for us. And it really will help with your blood sugar control. So those are the things that we're looking at. And that's how a diagnosis is derived, is looking at those two things, the fasting morning blood sugar number along with an A1C. Okay. So specifically, what does pre-diabetes mean? It means you're on the on the path to heading towards type yeah. two? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Just to sum it up, one word, yes. It means yeah, okay, path. yeah. Okay, so who who's at risk for pre-diabetes or diabetes? You know, it's shocking to me how much more common it is now than when I started my career, right? Mm -hmm. When I first went back to school in the early 90s, <clears throat> leaving the world of electrical engineering and systems engineering, things like that, and going to naturopathic medical school, at that time, uh, type 2 diabetes, pre-diabetes were nowhere near as common as today. It's been a sharp ramp like this in terms mm -hmm. of the increased number of people who are struggling with this problem. So with that in mind, who's at risk? Anyone who um, is under chronic levels of stress. <clears throat> Excuse me. So here in terms of the current situation with the global health threat, you know, yes. there's a lot of people feeling stressed. That's for sure. Yep. And I'm concerned that on the other side of this, we're just going to have even more people with prediabetes and type 2 diabetes because the conditions are ripe. So that's one on-ramp, chronic stress, unrelieved stress. Another on-ramp is uh, poor, poor sleep. People who have insomnia, people who don't sleep through the night, People who have uh, are awakened multiple times um, can't get back to sleep. Maybe they can go to sleep okay. They just don't stay asleep, et cetera. Mm -hmm. They're at risk. Anyone who has a sleep disorder, like say sleep apnea, especially obstructive sleep apnea, where the airway closes and the body perceives that, of course, as an emergency, because you got to breathe. There's nothing right. optional about breathing. They're at big risk of type 2 diabetes and prediabetes. A lot of people with sleep apnea have, have also diabetes issues, right? Another on-ramp for this could be uh, a sedentary job, a lack of motion, coupled with perhaps a lack of regular exercise that is um, of the kind that will make the difference. So no strength and resistance training, no aerobics just for fun and mental health, you know, just exercising can be so good for our spirits and our minds, right? Our mental health. Those are the things that put people most at risk. There's a few others I'm going to mention um, that are just as important, but people don't think of this way. Environmental toxicity. If you've been exposed, let's say, in your childhood, if you're like me and you grew up near uh, oil refineries, for instance, that's a classic way to be at risk for prediabetes or type 2 diabetes. The toxicity of that um, situation, if you haven't done cleansing and detoxification programs or check to see how your, your, your body's natural ability to detoxify is, you might be at more risk for type two diabetes and or obesity or both put together as they call it diabetes. There's a reason why these things happen in clusters in some communities. And then I would say the uh, final one would be a history of trauma, a history of adverse childhood experiences, traumatic, difficult things that have happened to you, whether they are in your childhood or as an adult that now have really altered how your mind and body respond to stresses your resilience has been shattered and it, with it, it has taken your blood sugar um, balance, your blood sugar control, you know, the stress hormones of cortisol, et cetera. It makes a huge difference. And once that process is hijacked, if your blood sugar is hijacked like that, it's a root cause thing. You're going to need to work on those hurts so that you can free yourself of the triggers that cause your blood sugar to go on that roller coaster. Wow. Um, it's a lot. It, that I mean, I'm, I really, you've kind of just blown my mind because, um, you know, uh, so many, so many people could fall into this category, you know, with so the many. chronic stress, all of us right now, the poor sleep, many of us, um, the sedentary jobs, you know, those of us who are working at a computer, working from home, working at an office, and then, oh, now it's winter time, so it's a little darker, so maybe you're not going to go out and get a walk because it's too dark and it's cold. Um, the environmental toxicity is huge that impacts so many of us here in the U S and then the history of trauma or adverse experiences. Wow. Okay. So definitely. All right. So talk to me a little bit about how lifestyle choices impact blood sugar. Yeah. So, you know, this is a great question. Um, Jess, let, let's, let's dig in here. Okay. I recently yeah. had a chance to do a series on the five social determinants of health. So when we look at this, you know, as you tease it apart, it's really important that people are able to live in an environment that has clean, healthy air, that they can drink clean, healthy water, 
and that they can safely move about. So once you leave your home, it's great if the environment outside you is safe. You know, do you have sidewalks where you live, right? Particularly if you're in a city or a suburbs area, because sometimes some communities don't really have that. It makes it unsafe mm-hmm. just to be out in the street, right? You could get run yep. over because there's no place to just be. <laughs> um, similarly, you want to know that, you know, if you've gone for a run or something like that, that you're still going to be safe, right? And not perceived immediately as some criminal, you know, and, and have all the things that might go with that that are so bad when really you're just trying to exercise like anybody else, right? Yep. Um, you also want to make sure that people can be in an environment that's not too noisy because otherwise when you try to sleep and rest, you're, the back of your mind, your hind brain, so to speak, what's called your reticular activating system goes on high alert because you're constantly being startled while you're trying to sleep. Your body's like, what is going on? Bottom line, blood sugar's gone up. <laughs> and you, in, you, the, the, the recipe is there, the conditions by which you can have a problem with blood sugar. You know, just here we go, right? Stress, people don't get a break. Sometimes they have extraordinary difficult circumstances and it just goes on and on. I've certainly watched where I live any number of, say, small businesses like restaurants, um, retailers, uh, clothing stores, dry cleaners, et cetera, just poof, they're gone because of the timing of this global um, health threat is such that their businesses weren't viable. They didn't do anything wrong, you know, didn't make any big mistakes. They just, it's just bad luck. There's nothing else to charge that to, right? So all of these things, they, they make a difference. And then the kinds of foods we eat, you know, look, listen, for people who have uncertain financial circumstances, the cheapest foods, unfortunately, are also the foods with the least nutrient density. Let me say that another way. The cheapest foods are usually high in the simple, most blood sugar harmful carbohydrates, not the good slow burning carbohydrates. They are full of the unhealthy kinds of fat. Um, there's nowhere near enough fiber to be helpful for your blood sugar. And there's very little to no protein, which means your blood sugar is going to get hammered constantly. But people are trying to eat to feel full and they may not have the health background to know what's really a healthy nutrition plan for them. People skip meals sometimes to save money or because they're stressed and busy running from job to job. A lot of people classically who have type 2 diabetes, they don't eat lunch. That's a long time to go from, say, breakfast, which was probably not the healthiest breakfast, let's be fair, no lunch. And then by the time they had dinner, man, they're ready to eat a bear. It's yeah. not, it's not a good recipe. Your, your blood sugar, your hormones are just getting hammered the whole day. Yep. So what are, let's deep dive a little bit more into that. What are some of the unhealthy fats that you say, if, you know, if you want people to choose, you know, better food choices, what fats should people absolutely be avoiding? Ideally look at your labels and read them. And if it says it's a trans fat, if it says it's hydrogenated, or partially hydrogenated, that's a no, don't eat it. <laughs> I'm just gonna, we're gonna yep. hone in on that. You want the foods, you want the foods that you eat to be healthy as much as possible. And the healthy fats are the kinds of fats that are naturally found in things like nuts, seeds, avocado, olives, et cetera. Those are great. They're so helpful for you. Sesame, there's a lot of helpful oil sources. And with that in mind, you wanna focus in on that. But read those labels, I'm telling you, if they say, Trans fat, hydrogenated fat, partially hydrogenated fat, put it back down. Those, okay. That's the kind of fat that will gum up the flow of blood in your blood vessels mm-hmm. and leads to things like atherosclerosis and arteriosclerosis, which is what can cause those fatty plaques that stick to the walls of your blood vessels and can cause the heart attacks and strokes. So to keep it short and simple, avoid those fats. Okay. So I understand that <clears throat> before you were a doctor, you were um, a MIT electrical engineer and- yes. And I also understand that you, with the, with the protocol that you've developed to help support people with, um, with their blood sugar issues, that you used a systems approach that was inspired or influenced by your previous career. So I'm wondering if you might tell us a little bit about that, because I understand you like to simplify complex things. Yeah, sure, Jess. I try to I try to keep it real and make it so people can understand. So what inspired it was um, having started my clinical practice in the '90s. I couldn't help but notice as we went into the 2000s, how many more people were showing up with some kind of diabetes, particularly type two diabetes or pre-diabetes, you know? And with that journey, I realized there was this growing tide. I didn't know it would be this growing um, tsunami of of an event, but wow, you know, heart disease used to be the number one thing. It still is the number one thing here in the US, but diabetes is the number one thing people don't know they have, specifically type two diabetes, pre-diabetes. In the case of type one, people will know because it's life-threatening and far more dramatic in its presentation. 
That's when the pancreas is not making but um, any insulin whatsoever. Different situation, they must take insulin for the rest of their lives. Type 2 diabetes, pre-diabetes can absolutely be really helped and perhaps reversed um, with lifestyle measures. So in that, you know, for people to recognize who they are and what they need, this has been just one of the most amazing things. So I realized if I just took a deep breath and stepped back and said, hey, you know, I used to work in Silicon Valley as a systems engineer. We always look at things as processes. Clearly in the body, there's different systems at play. There's our hormonal system, which includes insulin. It includes estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, cortisol, et cetera, right? There's also the systems around nutrition, like the time of day we eat. Do we have regular eating habits? Are they healthy? There's systems in terms of sleep. Do we have good sleep habits? Go to bed at the same time, get up at the same time. We make sure we're in a cool room, it's dark, et cetera. Like, like are we doing what we would now call sleep hygiene? You know, putting that together. And then finally, understanding what the role is of exercise with blood sugar regulation, especially as we get older, because our needs change. What works for a 20 something or 30 something year old man or woman might not work the same way for someone in their 50s, 60s, 70s. The game changes, right? Yeah. So when I went to naturopathic medical school and really any of the medical school books you would have read at that time all said that type two diabetes only happens for people a lot older, like in their 70s. Uh, no, <laughs> that's the shift that's happened since I've started my career. So from the 90s to now in the 2020s, it's crazy because we have kids with type 2 diabetes. We have 10 year olds being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. This was unheard of before, absolutely unheard of. And so in that, what has inspired me around that desire to reach and help 3 million people is simply, I really love to see a big change in this because I feel this is the one chronic illness we can do a ton of good for quickly because it is so lifestyle sensitive. But it does mean that some of the policies that we have for healthcare are going to need to shift in order to make that happen. We're going to make it easier for people to exercise safely where they live, whether it's at home or a gym or whatever makes sense, a recreation center, but to get it done and to understand what's important for them and that building that muscle mass is really going to be key. You know, I'm a former athlete and I, have, I feel like I have an advantage for a lifetime because I have, I'm a, mus I'm a muscular person and I realize over time how much of a gift that is for me that's helping me hugely. You know, yeah. in the case of my family, one side of my family has quite a struggle with blood sugar problems, profound one. And I'm not having that struggle. And I think it's because of that prior base. You know, I just lucked into this, right? It all worked out. Yeah. So I put it together in a system to package it up so that other people have to struggle and take forever to figure all of that out, right? This is concise, yeah. it's together, and it's ready to go. I think that's a really important point that you brought up. A lot of people don't talk about that. And that's, and, and I, it, you know, when you're a child, if you are, you know, exposed to different athletic sports and, and you kind of get in the habit of that and working out from a, you know, being a young age, playing, playing team sports and stuff and carrying that through your entire adult life is, is such a wonderful foundation to have uh, because then you, you love exercise and it's not something that it's a chore. It's something that you recognize makes you feel good and you, you appreciate, you know, the endorphins and, and the release and, and building muscle. So I think that's really great. Um, okay. So you, let's talk a little bit about your book, um, because you, you uncovered in this book and, and you share with us that there are, um, you know, health disparities specifically for African American women that they are experiencing in the U.S. medical and healthcare system that's that's leading to delayed assessments, inadequate treatments, and overall worse outcomes compared to other groups. So, will you tell us a little bit about like why is that happening and like what can we do about it? Yeah, you know, it's interesting, right? So, I was originally approached by a publisher at the end of the '90s in 1998 to write this book, and it came out in the year 2000, and the issue is still there. So, at the time in the '90s. Um, for the U.S., heart disease in general was a relatively static phenomenon. The one group that was getting worse outcomes and more people were showing up with the problem was African-American women specifically. Since then, in the 2010s, um, that shifted. So in the 2000s, that was still the case. And then in the 2010s, other groups, unfortunately, caught up. <laughs> I was, no. Everybody started getting worse, right? But for yeah. some reason, we were ahead of the pack. And in that has been the issues that you've brought up, Jess. One is access to competent healthcare. Two is also making sure that people are assessed 
fully and accurately. Like now you can go to urgent care centers and emergency rooms around the country because sometimes I just poke in to see what's going on. You'll see posters up talking about how women's presentation of heart disease is different than men's, specifically for heart attacks. That you have the stereotypical thing with the man clutching his chest, falling to the floor, and people think of that, oh, it's a heart attack. And that women's symptoms may be far more subtle than that, not likely to be dramatic, obvious presentation. And there's a lot more awareness now as time has gone by than was the case in the 90s, thus the book. So I, I you know, went along with what the, the publisher asked me to do and got the data and wrote the book. And this was, you know, before the internet was such an easy place to get all this data. So shout out to the National Institutes of Health uh, because one of their researchers there, in particular at the National Heart and Blood, uh, Heart and Lung Institute, um, because he really helped me with getting real-time data because we were faxing stuff back and forth, if you can imagine. <laughs> this is pre Easy technology, right? Yeah. But there are, I just want to say that there are some good people of goodwill who really do try to help make sure those of us who are trying to get the word out can stand on facts and not have to make it up or assume. And so in that, we found that there were issues with um, access, issues with being heard and taken seriously. We've certainly seen things come to the fore where Black women like, say, a Serena Williams, when she's giving birth, is not being taken seriously and almost winds up losing her life to a blood clot, et cetera. You know, the, the ways in which we're not always listened to, valued, or taken seriously. Women in general in the medical world can be dismissed. Certainly Black women, absolutely. And when we talk about pain or discomfort, people sometimes don't want to hear it, and they don't do the full evaluation and workup that we absolutely deserve to have happen. Therefore, when we talk about those social determinants of health, one of them is health literacy along with education. We as consumers have to know and be empowered because sometimes we got to be our own advocate or the people who go with us to make sure that health professionals are listening, that they know that we know, and that we really are expecting to have that full workup where it's appropriate. Because I, I'm surprised at how often these things get missed, where I'm like, wow, that was a really great clue. You, you did your part. You said what was wrong, but the mm -hmm. person who was listening wasn't actually listening. So what are some good you know, follow-up questions that if... if um if a person's in their doctor's office and they feel like they're not being listened to or heard, like what are some other ways that um, that people, whether it be women or men, you know, could really kind of prompt further and dig deeper to kind of clue in that that practitioner that they're working with that, hey, there's something else here. And like really, like you said, be an advocate for their own for their own self and for their own health. Like what 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 should they do? Yeah. So. Um, there's, a, there's a few paths here. So let's give people some language and some bridges, right? So that they can get what they need because some of these visits are so short, it's really hard <laughs> to get that across. Yeah. I think is it just take a deep breath. Do those, those physical cues if you're in person or if it's telemedicine, same thing, pause, take a deep breath and look the person right in the eye, you know, and say, you know what? I'm concerned that you're not taking this as seriously as I would like. Here's what I said. I don't know that you really heard it, so can you tell me back what you think I just said? Because your response doesn't match what I'm expecting. And I'm really counting on you to bring your A game here. That's so powerful. I love that. You got to claim your power because look, you're the customer. You've hired this person to help you, right? Right. So claim mm -hmm. your power, stand in your truth and let them know. For all we know, right. they just had a really bad day. They might right. not be feeling well themselves or they could be not so good at this. <laughs> it's not right. I mean, not all doctors are great. Like, not all doctors you know, are great. You know, it's like car mechanics, accountants, whoever. Some teachers, people are fabulous. Like not, every, not everybody is the, the top of their profession. And, and not every moment either, because all of us are human. Right. Some days are exactly. better than others. And, you know, okay. there are times when I've had, because I've had to do it <laughs> myself, and it's just really helpful because it puts them on complete notice that you're here, you're noticing, and you're really expecting more. And it gives them a choice in that moment, right? They can either bring that A game if they have it to bring, they can ask someone else to come in to be part of that uh, view, another health professional, et cetera, or you maybe just hit the pause button or they'll refer you or you refer yourself somewhere else. But but don't but people listen, you know, whoever's listening to this man, woman, whoever you are, whatever your, your demographic, we're all people, we're all humans. We deserve to be respected and taken seriously. And if you know in that moment that something's not right, that's your chance to change the game in your favor. This okay. really shouldn't be such an issue, but it comes up so much. And I look at some of the things that I either see on the news or I read a newspaper, I hear from my friends and family, from my own patients, from their experiences, my personal experience, or on social media. And I'm beginning to realize more and more, we have got to find a way to make it a more even exchange. It shouldn't be that 
for instance, like say a knee pain and replacement of a knee joint. I've definitely run into patients, often overweight or obese women, for whom the doctors refuse to do a knee replacement surgery. And they just say to, to her, she needs to lose weight and exercise more. And I'm like, how the hell is she going to do that when she's in excruciating pain? This is how you know that person has zero empathy. Mm -hmm. This isn't a reasonable request. If you replace the body part, the knee joint, get out of that pain and build up that musculature, do the physical therapy to recover, then they can exercise <laughs> and do all the other things. Right. I, I just, I'm like, it's just so bass backwards. It's crazy. <laughs> So what, like, what would be a key indicator? I mean, outside of like, you feel like you're being ignored for you to like yeah. understand that the person that's, you know, across the table from you or that you're sitting in the office with is lacking, lacking empathy and might not be a good fit for you. Like what, what are some other kind of open-ended questions or statements people could yeah. make to kind of get, you know, get to the bottom of that? So some good open-ended questions are to ask them, have they ever personally experienced this or something like it? And then be quiet, give them a chance to answer the question. And I'm going to say this because I want people to hear it. Don't assume because someone is different than you in whatever way, uh, whatever demographic, either their cultural experience, their ethnicity, their gender, their race, their economic status, you know, maybe money is at issue here, education, whatever. Don't assume that they don't have empathy because sometimes they do. They may not have actually experienced it. Like if I've given birth, I'm talking about giving birth. You know, I've had, I have kids and I'm talking to a man. Obviously, he hasn't had that opportunity, right? That doesn't mean he doesn't have empathy. He may have attended a whole bunch of births. You know, you never know what the other person's experience has been. Maybe they have had a chance to help people on some part of a journey. Maybe this is a person who's always been lean their whole life, but maybe they have family members who struggle with their weight and they've seen how important it has been to get control of blood sugar and to have a healthy cholesterol profile, et cetera. And they have all the empathy in the world because they know what the struggles are that go with it. They haven't lived it, but they have the empathy. On the other side, some people are very judgmental, assume they know every damn thing and they don't listen. They don't ask questions and you can't change their point of view. So they'll be like, well, exercise more and eat less. That's their whole prescription. Eat less and exercise more. And it's for all of it. And then sometimes people go and they're able to lose, let's say weight is the issue. Blood pressure comes down, but maybe their chief complaint was problems with what looks like might be gallstones. And it's still there when they've now lost the weight and they're, they're like hundred pounds leaner. Nobody was taking this seriously the whole way when they said they had that right flank pain that was probably gallstones, right? They've done all the things. They've exercised more. They <laughs> eat less. They've still got the primary problem. <laughs> you know, it's just not always that simple. So I always say to practitioners, please be thorough. Don't be lazy. Try to bring your empathy with you. And for anyone who's a patient or a client to just stand in your power, not necessarily to be defensive. That's not what I'm talking about but rather to make sure you're really being heard and that the steps being taken for you make sense for you. Okay. Awesome. I love that. Okay. So, um, what are some of the most important healthy lifestyle choices people can make if they want to restore healthy blood sugar levels? Like what, let's get on, let's get on the path and kind of help people start making yeah. some good choices today. Yeah, yeah. So when it comes to anything for blood sugar regulation, this would be for everyone in the world of diabetes. So type one diabetes, pre-diabetes, type two diabetes, right? Simple things you can do. Number one, leafy greens are your friends. I'm gonna say that again. Leafy greens are your friends all day, every day. So you wanna have them with all of your meals. And yes, this includes breakfast. These days now, a lot of times, if you buy food at a supermarket or store, you can get pre-washed greens ready to go. It could not be simpler or easier. It is so efficient. I really have appreciated how much that's changed in the last several years. They're inexpensive and they're ready to go. And you can have a handful or two of salad greens or other kinds of greens with your breakfast. In the summer time, when they're cool or chilled from the refrigerator, probably feels good. In the fall, winter season, spring, when it might be cooler out, you might want to give them a little bit of steam or just rinse them under tap water that is at um, room temperature or a little warmer just to take the chill off them. But put leafy greens with every single meal to make it easy. If you want to prepare um, batches of greens, let's say once or twice, like maybe a weekend batch. So cook something Saturday, Sunday, a big amount, maybe a refresh on Wednesday or Thursday. So to be specific, maybe you make collard greens or kale greens, bok choy, things like that as a bunch on Saturday or Sunday to get you through most of the week. And then my Wednesday, Thursday, you might need to refresh it. Maybe you're going to steam some broccoli, steam some uh, spinach, whatever you would enjoy. 
but get those leafy greens in you because those things are blood sugars, um, sponges. Leafy greens contain fiber, 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 fiber. It's so good for you. You can add a uh, ground flaxseed meal to your food or just take it in a little bit of water. You always have to have a lot of water when you have fiber. So you don't wind up constipated. You want it to expand. When you drink the water with your fiber, the fiber absorbs the water and expands. That expansion goes through your intestinal tract. And that signal as it hits the colon says, whoops, we got to have a bowel movement. We got to move the bowels, right? You get the whole system going. So that's a straightforward way. Um, another thing for a tip, a straightforward tip to do is to make sure you have those meals and no snacks. So you're going to have regular meals. You're going to have an actual breakfast, you have an actual lunch and an actual dinner. If you're doing intermittent fasting, you know the importance of regular meals. You do it in that timed eating window, but healthy quality meals. Similarly, you don't want to exhaust your gut. So ideally, you're going to leave three to five hours before bedtime from when you eat your last meal of the day. Let's say you had breakfast, you had lunch, you had dinner. So maybe you have dinner at 5 or 6 p.m. your local time zone. Okay, your bedtime's at 10. Great. Once you're done eating, you're done eating. Let your blood sugar start to drop and relax and go down, and decrease and reset overnight so you're ready for the next morning. Give your gut a chance to do all that repair and restoration that if you're constantly stuffing food in, it can't do. Great. Great tips. Okay. So let's talk about sleep because I know you are a big, big advocate for all things sleep. <laughs> if people are having a hard time sleeping and they're stressed or they suffer from, you know, insomnia, whether that's chronic or intermittent, um, you know, let, let's talk about some healthy lifestyle choices that people can do to support a, like a nighttime ritual and, mm -hmm. you know, getting ready to fall asleep and stay asleep. This is such a rich moment. Thank you for asking that and talking about it as a nighttime ritual. You know, I think back to my own childhood and I always invite people to think about aspects that they like about their own childhood or what they would or what they wish had had, depending on how their childhood went. Right. Because some people had chaotic childhoods. Um, I think most of us can appreciate the importance with young children of a regular bedtime. Most parents know that if life is too crazy, it's just going to be really hard with the kids, right? You want things to be stable as much as you possibly can. So I always invite people to create their own bedtime routine. Like if as a child, maybe you had a nice warm bath and you had your snuggly pajamas and maybe your parents read you a story, you know, you sang a lullaby, something, something beautiful and peaceful, but a very clear transition to the expectation that it was time for you to go to sleep. You got into your bed, you put your head on your pillow and you went to sleep, right? Okay, so as an adult, we have far more control over this stuff than we did as a kid. <laughs> so I tell people, what do you like about that? And for some people, they're very sensitive to, to smells, right? Like they like aromatherapy. Like right now, I've got a little thing here of lavender, right? So let's involve our lavender. Give yourself a sniff or two. Maybe you're like, <laughs> we did this. You're like <laughs> that'd be great it. over Zoom. When did that's the next <laughs> paper app? Have a smell app. <laughs> You can have lavender, chamomile, you know, whatever you like for a smell that's, that's um, life affirming and soothing, calming for you, you know, as part of your bedtime routine, your apps, right? Like right now I'm wearing this uh, gizmo, this ring, and it, it tells me quite regularly, hey, it's time to wind down. I already know it though. I can usually feel my energy shift, you know, you can use apps to remind you, but whatever. So get yourself a clear transition at least two hours before bedtime where you're done with the emails, no more text messages, no more social media, just di disengage from all that stuff. It's too, it has too much potential to be upsetting in my opinion and cause your stress levels to go up at a time when you should be chilling out, right? So don't let something else hijack you because if it's a crisis like that, you know what, it can wait till the next day <laughs> unless it's yeah. a really a crisis. And you can always set your phone for emergency settings so that it can let you know if there's actually a problem going, right? Okay. Start to relax. So off of email, all the messages, all the apps and devices, two hours before bedtime, done. Goes for TV too, right? TV news, too. News, all that kind of, all that stuff. Don't go to bed on the news. Yeah. No, <laughs> don't fall asleep with the TV on, you guys. It's not good. You know, if you need, if you need blank noise, there's uh, all kinds of blank noise things on the internet to play in order for you to go to sleep, but not the news uh, or m movies, things on the screen. Ah, you know, you, you don't want that, right? Yeah. Okay. So your chill out time. If you enjoy reading, or if you want to listen to um, audiobook or whatever, something that's calming, music, whatever works for you, 
put calming and soothing. You want the last two hours of the day to be peaceful. Again, let your blood sugar have a chance to relax and not have stress. Grab that blood sugar hijack it and give you a spike because you suddenly now are freaked out, right? Okay, mm-hmm. go to bed at the same time each night. Get up at the same time each day, even if you struggle with sleep. There's some wonderful books like the one called Why We Sleep that really help you to understand what, why this is important. And if you want to have blood sugar balance, if you want to achieve blood sugar control and be healthy, this is important. You must get regular sleep. Even if it's a struggle, try your best. But for some people's habits, it's so chaotic. They go to bed at 10 o'clock, one night, one o'clock in the morning, another night, 11.30, 2 a.m. You can't do it. Yeah. So you and really got to- at the same time. Yeah, you've really got to prioritize making sleep one of the most important tools that you're incorporating into your lifestyle in order to stay healthy to uh, and, and really to stay in front of- um, aging really if you, if you want to yeah. slow down the the clock we've we've got to give our time uh, our body the time to rest and and restore itself and regenerate yep that's um, real and shift work is a disaster it yeah. just puts you into complete chaos your entire body is in chaos your hormones everything your neurotransmitters are just thrown up whoo, like that complete chaos so get off of shift work it is a disaster for health yeah and so and and if you are like quite frankly, with as many people um, quitting their jobs as they are right now, it's a great time to get a new job. So if you have a, if you have a a shift job work that um, really is detrimental to your health, do what Beverly says, you know, be empowered, take back control of your health and let's let's go get you a new job. Practical life along with all the research has shown how much of a problem the night shift specifically is. We're just not supposed to be up through the middle of the night. It's not good. Yeah, uh, that's a great reminder. Okay, so um, what what kind of recommendations would you have, Beverly, for people who are interested in exercise, but they're dealing, like the example you said earlier, they've got like a chronic knee issue, you know, and, they, mm-hmm. and there's an underlying something that's kind of preventing them from doing exercise. What types of low impact exercises do you think are, um, that you'd recommend and, you know, may be more readily available to people than they might even have an awareness of? Right. Sure. So if you've got a major injury, like to a knee or to a hip, those big joints of the body, right, that can really prevent you from doing some of the more power based kinds of exercise. But you can still do things where you're seated or lying down. And one of the nice things is um, there's a lot of people who are either fitness experts or personal trainers and physical therapists who have all sorts of helpful videos, chiropractors, too, on YouTube. So you can use something like YouTube and search and say, hey, um, show me some exercises for people who are seated. So sitting exercises, um, things that work around any issues you have and you can look through and see what's offered out there. And then I would say, look carefully at the comments and see, because a lot of times people who have these problems will comment, hey, this was a great video, this helped me. I wasn't able to use my knee for blah, blah, blah. And this was a great workaround. You'll get some good feedback that way. That's one of the better uses of the internet. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) The mixed bag. But I'd say that that's probably really helpful. If you have access in your community and you have the resources, you could certainly work with either a personal trainer, um, a physical therapist, a chiropractor, whoever has that personal fitness bent in your community and the training who can help you design a customized plan so you can work around whatever your injury or your pain source is right now as you get that worked out. Awesome. Okay. So, um, if people are interested in more of your ideas uh, about food and lifestyle choices, I understand you've got some great recipes in your book as well. Is that is that correct? Yeah, I have one there in the book for uh, collard greens made in a very healthy way. So it does not involve any lard or fat back, but we have much healthier ways to cook it. Um, collard greens can be so healthful, such a rich source of fiber and tasty, nutrient dense, lots of minerals. You know, so many people are depleted in minerals. We were talking a little bit before we started this recording about magnesium and other things that people are just missing because the soils aren't nutrient dense anymore. As a result, the food that's grown in the soil is not nutrient dense. We're, we're not enjoying the same nutrient density that our grandparents and great-grandparents did. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. So we have supplements and herbs just make sense in today's world. We just don't have what they did at that time. Yeah. 
So um, Beverly, how can people get in touch with you if if what you've said today is, you know, struck a chord and people are like, wow, I, I need to work with her. Can you tell us a little bit about how people can get in touch with you and um, how they might be able to actually like work with you and learn more about the Yates protocol? Sure, sure. They're always welcome to go to my website, which I know all this info will be in the show notes. So the website is uh, www.dr, B-E-V-E-R-L-Y, Y-A-T-E-S dot com. So it's D-R, like the abbreviation for doctor, then Beverly, and then Yates dot com. You can always send a message that way through the website. There's um, downloads available there, um, a way to schedule a call if you're interested in working together, things of that nature. There's also the social media links on the usual platforms. And I'm going to revitalize my YouTube channel and put all sorts of goodies up there. Um, there's just a lot of ways to connect in today's world. But I always recommend that people take action. You know, if this is for you, then don't wait. Because here's the deal. Blood sugar problems are cruel and relentless, and they don't wait. They continue to do damage. They're like little pickaxes and jackhammers in terms of what they do in your body, just destroying things left and right and across all systems. We talked about systems earlier, right? Your yeah. eyes are being attacked. Your kidneys are under attack. Your end circulation, fingertips, toes, um, your clitoris or penis, your nose, et cetera, you know, all of these things, your eyes, 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 they're just being attacked all the time by your blood sugar. Of course, your heart, that's a big factor as well. Uh, all of the organs really are compromised. And it's one of those things that take heart. You can do something about this. It's so lifestyle sensitive. That's the good news. You actually have a chance at this. Unlike some other chronic illnesses where it can be a lot harder to make a change, this one is straightforward. Yeah, I really appreciate your empowering message and how you are so committed to number one, helping so many people, but really educating the the, the populace on you know the fact that many of these underlying issues are you know they're relevant to to many of us, and there is something that we can do about it. There is something we can do about it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So thank you so much for your time today, Beverly. It was great to see you. And um, you guys, like she said, we're going to post all of her contact information in the show notes. And I highly recommend you get in touch with Dr. Beverly Yates if you're interested in taking back control of your health and addressing your blood sugar issues. Have a wonderful day. Yep. We'll see you later. Thank you. Big heart to you. <laughs> I love it.